Good morning, brothers and sisters. As we proceed in our study in the book of Judges, should we ask for our Heavenly Father's guidance so that we may more properly understand the figures and symbols that are presented herein for and how these will relate to the movement and how things are to proceed at this time in earth's history. Shall we pray? Loving Father in heaven, you know our needs, you know our desires. More importantly, you know us better than we know us. As we open your word, we ask, Father, for your guidance, your direction, and your blessing. Help us that as we assemble together, we might be able to understand the figures and the symbols that are being shown before us so that we may more properly understand that which you would have us to do for this day. I thank you for each one that is attending this study and those that will attend later. Help us now, guide us. May your angels attend us. May your spirit be with us so that we may draw ever closer to you. For this, we thank you, and for this, we praise you, now and always, in Jesus' name, amen. Okay. Now, as we enter into and continue our study in the book of Judges, we are now opening Judges chapter 7. There are several points within this book that were looked upon by the translators. And there are many points that Elder Jeff has considered and has presented before us. Now, as we look at this, the translators would break this up in the following way. Gideon's army of two and 30,000 is by God's direction reduced to 300. He is sent into the enemy's camp by night where he is encouraged to hear a dream told with its interpretation. He divideth his army into three companies, giving each man a trumpet and a large a lamp in a pitcher. On his approach, the Midianites are thrown into confusion and put to flight. The Ephraimites take Oreb and Zeb and put them to death. Now, this last section brings up one of the questions that we were addressing yesterday. If we're to take a look at this, when we looked upon Judges 6, and please forgive me, I am a little tired today. I did not, I did not quite get in as early as I, I would like to have. I apologize. Okay. I, I was, I was considering okay. something else. Okay. Well, in Judges 6, we have the sign of the fleece and so forth. So. Right. I was, I was considering the call to the different tribes, and that's, that's something else entirely. Yeah. Okay. Now, Judges 7, verse 1. Then Jerubal, who is Gideon, 
And all the people that were with him rose up early and pitched beside the well of Herod, so that the host of the Midianites were on the north side of them, by the hill of Moray, in the valley. Now, in Judges 7.1, we have this hill of Moray. What is this saying to us? This is Moray, a Canaanite. This is not Mara. This is not either the Mara of the two of the three visions that we have considered in the past: the Calzon, the Moray, and the Mara. This is something different altogether. Mm-hmm. So. Gideon has arisen early with all the people that were with him. And they pitched beside the well of Herod. Why would they be pitching beside this well? What are they looking for? I don't know. Well, this is the fountain of trembling. Okay. That's the well of Harad. I mean, they, they obviously need water. Okay. Now I must apologize a second time. If we look back at Judges 635. Mm-hmm. Gideon sent messengers throughout all Manasseh, who also was gathered after him, and he sent messengers unto Asher and unto Zebulun and unto Naphtali, and they came up to meet him. Right, yep. So we have, um, because we had commented that Ephraim wasn't invited. But yet the Ephraimites take Oreb and Zeb, as we will find later in this chapter. Okay. So we we have something to look forward to, but we have something to puzzle over as we are going through this this section. So those that were with Gideon rose up early and pitched beside the well of Harad the well of trembling so that the Midianites were to their north in the valley. And the Lord said unto Gideon, the people that are with thee are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands. Lest Israel vaunt themselves against me saying, mine own hand hath saved me. What is Christ saying here? As I'm reading this. Well, well, you don't want to give credit. You don't want people to believe that they somehow were responsible for the victory. Um, I don't need to have that many. I want to show that this is God's power defeating the enemy. Okay. You know, and this is a problem too, because one of the the aspects of human nature is, you know, we want us we want to have, for instance, we would like, you know, if Doug Batchelor joined this message, or if Walter Veith joined this message, or something like that, you know, there's or some big name. Uh, we would feel more confidence. But when it comes to this movement, God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the wise. And, And he does this in the story of Gideon. He has 
the least likely person to lead the, a very small number of people that would hardly be expected to defeat such a large enemy. But that's really the same way in the Christian life as well. I mean, we have, there's no way that we can defeat the enemy without Christ. If we place this in a little simpler method, and that's, that's what I'm having to do as tired as I am right now. Mm -hmm. Isn't Christ saying, I want and I need your total dependence upon me and upon me alone? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> now, therefore, go to proclaim in the ears of the people, saying, Whosoever is fearful and afraid, let him return and depart early from Mount Gilead. And there returned of the people twenty and two thousand, and there remained ten thousand. Now, as we've studied in prior chapters, we came to a point where we were confronted with 10,000 talents. Here we are confronted with 10,000 people. We have <clears throat> 22,000 that take leave of Gideon, that choose that they are fearful and afraid, and they leave. Now, 220, as we've studied in the past, is a symbol of restoration, is a symbol shown in the story of Jacob and Esau of being restored and no longer separated. Yet here we have a people that are separating themselves. Why is this symbol being shown in reverse? Is this emphasizing something for us today? Well, I mean, we did see in this movement a separation, a progressive separation that has, has occurred. And that progressive separation began about 2014 mm -hmm. and has continued right up unto 2021 and after. Yeah, though we believe that um, there comes a point where that separation stops and unity begins. Now, so Gideon has the people assembled near Mount Gilead. Gideon has the Midianites assembled to his north. Twenty-two thousand men have now left Gideon, and there now remains the symbol of the ten thousand. Mm -hmm. Now it's interesting for me because with the translators, what we're looking at here. Whosoever is fearful and afraid, the translators looked at it using Deuteronomy 20, verse 8. And the officers shall speak further unto the people, and they shall say, What man is there that is fearful and faint hearted? Let him go and return unto his house, lest his brethren's heart faint as well as his heart. At that time, it was looked that these that were fearful and faint-hearted 
would become a bad influence upon those that remained. Much is the same in the story of Gideon, and we are seeing much the same today. Now, they also chose 1 Maccabees 3.16. And when he came near to the going up of Beth Haran, Judas went forth to meet him with a small company. Judas Maccabeus did not go forward with a large group. He went forward with a small company. And the Lord said unto Gideon, the people are yet too many. Bring them down unto the water, and I will try them for thee there. And it shall be that of whom I say unto thee, this shall go with thee, the same shall go with thee. And of whomsoever I say unto thee, this shall not go with thee, the same shall not go. So he brought down the people under the water, and the Lord said unto Gideon, Everyone that lappeth of the water with his tongue, as a dog lappeth, him shalt thou set by himself. Likewise, everyone that boweth down upon his knees to drink. And the number of them that lapped, putting their hand to their mouth, were 300 men, and all of the rest of the people bowed down upon their knees to drink water. Now, is this a confusion of symbol? What do you mean a confusion of symbol? Well, I watched many dogs lap at their water. They don't put their paws to their mouth. Yeah. Here we're being shown that those that choose to drink as a dog would drink. Lapping at the water. Exposing themselves because what they are doing is they're sticking their tongue out to get a drink are very different from those that fall upon their knees and then continue to drink. Are we not seeing a division in character here of a type? Dealing with the tongue? Yep. What are, what are you trying to say? What I'm what I'm I trying could... to get what I'm trying to get at is that there are those here lapping like a dog that are not fearful of what is around them. They're they don't care if they're being ridiculed, they don't care if they are are being called out. They're accepting this publicly and directly. I'm looking at this and I'm applying this with those that have remained since July 18th. Okay. So, so you have some that are going down, so they're not worried about what's going to happen. They're not aware of the enemy. Well, okay. Let's, let's look at it this way. You find a stream. You find a stream that you see as being cool and refreshing and you are sorely in need of a drink. There would be those that would fall upon their knees, that would cup their hands and use their hands as a method to bring water up to their mouths. They would open their mouths and admit the water in. 
Yeah. Those that are lapping at it like a dog could also fall upon their knees, but they're sticking their tongue out to obtain the water. It's not just that they're opening their mouths, they're putting their tongue out, taking this in little by little, not in great gulps. They're looking to get the most necessary refreshment that they can. We have all at times looked to take in the Bible in great gulps. We have all been impatient because we would like to say things move much faster. We would all love to see the work in this world close and for Christ to come. How many of us are willing to stick our tongue out to lap at the source of living water? How many of us are not afraid of those around us, of those within the movement, of those that look to have stood with us, but have not? Are we willing to stand even when we are ridiculed? Now this symbol becomes, and the number of them that lapped, putting their hand to their mouth, were 300 men. But all of the rest of the people bowed down on their knees to drink water. Do, do we all not bow before God? Are we all not saying the same things? Even so, come Lord Jesus. How few are really willing to accept what he is saying, where Palmoni is leading. Judges 7.7, 7, and the Lord said unto Gideon, by the 300 men that lapped will I save you and deliver the Midianites into thine hand and let all the other people go, every man unto his place. What do we see here? What symbols are there? Is God going to save this people by a great number in a great movement? No, it's a small number. Now, there's a comment in the chat. I find the references to Archer in the name Jerubel and in Moray quite interesting, along with early rain, teacher, or just rain sprinkling, and then the use of specific Strong's references, with a further reference to Proverbs 8, 17, and 8, 34. Why do you see these verses as being important? They, they talk about rising early, setting off to battle early, 
And Proverb 8, 17 says, I love them that love me and those that seek me early shall find me. Proverb 8, 34 said, blessed is the man that heareth me, watching daily at my gates, waiting at the posts of my doors. We're to be ever ready and ever willing to go to battle, to hear from the Lord and to commit our lives to him on a daily basis. Okay, thank you. What else are we seeing here? What other comments do you have? Well, if you're talking to me, I believe in trying to be as alert as possible uh, in the situations I'm in. And I'm a person who is easily distracted. So it is a severe discipline to keep focused. But I do realize that hearing from God is the most important thing that I or anybody can be doing right now and following through on what he tells us. As a testimony, over the last several days, I've been confronted with some situations with friends and those that I care about. All of these have been, the, have been of those that have either grown up in or been baptized into the Seventh-day Adventist faith. I've been confronted with, with some that have chosen to state that Ellen White is okay, but she and her writings are not on a par with the Bible. Now, this is something that I've had to stand up about and been very clear about. It concerns me because I've had those that have started down this path, that they have read something in the spirit of prophecy that goes contrary to their own belief. Therefore, they are choosing to set that aside. It's a dangerous path whenever we set aside scripture or set aside the spirit of prophecy and try to make that into something of private interpretation. Too many times I've had people make the comment that Ellen White was the lesser light. Therefore, we should not take her word in the same manner in which we take the Bible. And then I've heard other arguments where biblical interpretations are being offered that fly directly against that offered within the spirit of prophecy. In these situations, my heart indeed becomes heavy. I don't always have the words to express how truly sad this type of fallacious argument makes me. Gideon is an example to me of a calling together where there is a group that comes at the behest of the Lord 
and that the group becomes winnowed. They all start as wheat. And then they become separated. until finally there is only a small number remaining. And from that small number, a great victory is to be gained. So the people took victuals in their hand and their trumpets, and he sent all of the rest of Israel, every man unto his tent, and retained those 300 men, and the host of Midian was beneath him in the valley. So how many total were here? He ended up with 300, and with him, three. Excuse me, I don't. I didn't quite hear you. He he ended up if he include he himself. It's three hundred one. That's the point I'm just trying to get men. at. Yeah, just men. We're not thinking about angels right now, are we? I mean, no. I am, but no, we're talking. We're talking here in an inclusive count. We would have three hundred and one. Any disagreement with that comment? So here is Gideon plus his 300. And the host of Gideon was beneath them in the valley. So they are on the mountain. They are now looking at those in the valley. And it came to pass the same night that the Lord said unto him, Arise, get thee down unto the host, for I have delivered it into thine hand. But if thou fear to go down, go thou with Pura, thy servant, down to the host. So you have Gideon and a servant. Is the servant one of the 300, or is this an, another party that is in addition to the 300? I would say he would be part of the 300. Okay. But with Gideon being counted, 301 would be the correct count? Yes. Okay. Thank you. And thou shalt hear what they say. And afterward shall thy hands be strengthened to go down unto the host. Then went he down with Pura, his servant, unto the outside of the armed men that were in the host. Now the alternate reading here is unto the outside of the ranks by five. The translators applied Exodus 13.18 along with this verse. But God led the people about through the way of the wilderness of the Red Sea, and the children of Israel went up harnessed out of the land of Egypt. Here are the Midianites. Their host is being assembled by ranks of five. 
what does the name of Gideon's servant mean? Or are we given a translation of this? Camouflage. Camouflage. Here is Gideon with camouflage going down to the very camp of the enemy. And the Midianites and the Amalekites and the children of the east lay along the valley like grasshoppers for multitude. And their camels were without number as the sand of the sea side for multitude. So we have this threefold union. This group, which look to have all had some interrelation with Abraham, that are now coming against the children of Israel specifically against the tribes beginning with Manasseh. And when Gideon was come, behold, there was a man that told a dream unto his fellow and said, Behold, I dreamed a dream. And lo, a cake of barley bread tumbled into the host of Midian and came unto a tent and smote it that it fell and overturned it, that the tent lay along. Why a cake of barley bread? What is being symbolized by this? How was barley regarded at that time in the earth? Was this not the food for the common man, the coarsest of all the foods, the least desirable, but the one thing that almost all could afford? How else should we see this? How else do we see this? Was that the first spring crop? I think so. I believe it was. There we have it. Early fruits, a lot of the early rain. Okay. So Am this, I wrong? Am I getting the spring and fall reversed? <laughs> no, I, I think you're right. But no, the the barley would have been the the fruit that would ripen the first to give the announcement of the new year. So didn't the early rain occur more say between the summer and the fall and the latter rain occur just before harvest in the spring? I still get that mixed up, right? <laughs> Okay. And there's a, there's a so the, religious calendar, there's a calendar, yeah, the, calendar, there are different pieces. Yeah, the early rain is in the fall, the latter rains in the spring. Okay. 
yeah, fall and winter actually, late, what we would call winter. But the barley is is the first of the grains to ripen, right? Yeah, the barley's the first harvest. So the barley is what shows the benefit of the latter rain. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. The barley receives the latter rain. So this cake of barley comes unto a tent. And this cake, this barley bread, flattens the tent. What is the tent a symbol of? And why is it being flattened, being seen as being of such importance? Isn't a tent that which the Midianites and others would use to take refuge? Could it be that this tent is a symbol of incorrect methods of Bible study? Could it be that this tent is a symbol of man's wisdom? And when his fellow answered and said, this is nothing else save the sword of Gideon, the son of Joash, a man of Israel. For into his hand hath God delivered Midian and all of the host. Here is a Midianite telling his fellow, his compatriot, that the barley is Gideon. And that the Midianites are about to be defeated. This message gives great encouragement to Gideon. But is this fellow, this Midianite, beginning to spread fear and trembling throughout the camp of the Midianites? Is this admission about Gideon that gives Gideon such great encouragement? Something that we need to pay attention with, within the movement, within ourselves? And if so, how are we to do it? Gideon 7.15, and it was so when Gideon heard the telling of the dream and the interpretation thereof, worshipped and returned into the host of Israel and said, Arise, for the Lord hath delivered into your hand the host of Midian. Gideon hears another giving the interpretation of a dream. Joshua, excuse me, 
Joseph gave an interpretation of a dream to Pharaoh. There are many others within scripture that receive the interpretation of a dream. So now here is Gideon. He has received this interpretation of a dream and he returns into the house of Israel, into the host of Israel, and begins to proclaim to them to arise, for the Lord hath delivered into your hands the host of Midian. And he divided the 300 men into three companies. And he put a trumpet in every man's hand with empty pitchers and lamps within the pitchers. Now the alternate readings was that he put trumpets in the hands of all of them and firebrands or torches within the pitchers. Why is this important for us to understand? What symbols do we see here? Why are we seeing 301 trumpets and pitchers? What is important about this numerical value? What is important about this numerical symbol? <clears throat> uh, three and the one reminds me of Revelation 14 and 18. Agreed. 3 a.m. plus one. And then the, the, the pictures, well, we're, we're supposed to be earthen vessels, right? And the fire could be the spirit of God within us. Second Corinthians 4, 7. We have this treasure in earthen vessels. The power may be of God and not of us. What about the trumpet? A loud cry. The trumpets are used to call people to congregation. Mm -hmm. The trumpets are used as a warning, as in to call people to battle. And the trumpets also are prophetic in ref revelation, referring to um, the prophecies dealing with the fall of the Roman Empire and, of course, Islam. Okay. Right. Here is Gideon going up against the children of the East. Have we not applied that in the past as a symbol of Islam? Yep, so we have symbols of Islam here. And he said unto them, Look on me and do likewise. And behold, when I come to the outside of the camp, it shall be that as I do, so shall ye do.
when I blow a trumpet, I and all that are with me, then blow ye the trumpets. And on every side of the camp say, the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. So Gideon is giving instruction to all that are with him to follow his pattern, to follow his actions directly. Gideon goes in prepared with a trumpet. Gideon goes in prepared with a torch inside of an earthen vessel. So Gideon and the hundred men that were with him. So here you have 101 of the 301 came under the outside of the camp in the beginning of the middle watch. And they had but newly set the watch. And they blew the trumpets and break the pitchers that were in their hands. So this is the beginning of the middle watch. That is the middle watch of the night. How would we define the timing of the middle watch? Midnight. Right. So is Gideon and those with him giving the midnight cry? Yes. So if this is the midnight cry, is this preparation occurring on July 21st for the eminent midnight cry? Or is it, a, is it occurring on July 18th? Well, the midnight cry in our line is the July 18th way mark. Okay. So since this is the July 18th way mark, and since this had been given, so that the world would understand that Nashville was soon to be destroyed. Is it possible that this message of Gideon is so very similar to the message of July 18th as it was presented by Elder Jeff and those that have remained within this message, accepting the validity of the July 18th message. So I'm asking is if, if this hundred that stand with Gideon is not a symbol of those within the movement that have accepted the chronology that is being symbolized here, or am I making am I making a, a mistake in the way I'm applying this? So 
it's interesting to me. The Judges 718, the verse symbolizing July 18th, tells us that when I blow a trumpet, I and all that are with me, then blow ye the trumpets also on every side of all the camp and say, the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. Are there symbols here that we can relate to the message of July 18th? So Gideon and the hundred men that were with him, not the 300, but the one division, came onto the outside of the camp in the beginning of the middle watch at midnight. And they had but newly set the watch. So this was just after midnight. And they blew the trumpets. And they break the pitchers that were in their hands, Gideon and the hundred that were with him. And the others followed suit. And the three companies blew the trumpets and break the pitchers and held the lamps in their left hands and the trumpets in their right hands to blow with all. And they cried, the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. So you have torch you have a trumpet and they are crying they are stating the sword of the lord and of gideon what else do we see here what symbols can we take away from this And they stood every man in his place round about the camp. And all the host ran and cried and fled. Was it important for those that were with Gideon to have a sword? Did they slaughter the Midianites? Or did the Midianites slaughter each other? How were the Midianites destroyed? As the Lord said, every man's sword against his fellow, even throughout all the host. And this is common in God's battles. The enemy destroys himself. Symbolically, what were the Midianites reliant upon? The arm of flesh. Were they also not reliant upon an incorrect method of study? For all of these other methods of study, do not and have not been given by the Lord. And the 300 blew the trumpets, and the Lord set every man's sword against his fellow, even throughout all the host. And the host fled to Beth Shittah 
in Zareth and to the border of Abel, Mercola, or Mehola, unto Tabath. Now the word that is translated here as border is also given in the alternate reading to the lip. What do these different cities and areas translate as? What are they running to? Beth Shita means the house of something. What do we see? What are we finding? Now here again, we're dealing with Judges 7.22, the aftermath of midnight. Because Judges 7.21, would that not be also midnight with the result of the midnight cry of July 18th? You know, what really stands out to me, too, is that it was a vast army that they were coming up against, and Gideon's forces had to be spread out, even though there were so few of them. It said they stood every man in his place round about the camp. You know, so there was a lot of stealth going on there. <laughs> right. Judges 7.23. And the men of Israel gathered themselves together out of Naphtali and out of Asher and out of Manasseh and pursued after the Midianites. Why are the men of Israel now gathering out of these tribes? Is this of the 300? Is this of those that were called to give this message? Or are these those that were sent away of the 22,000 and of the 9,700? It's interesting when we look at this, that here are these 300 that are given a message to proclaim. And others, when they hear of the message, come to join. Now we've, we've said in the past, that there will be those that will be of the priests and those that will become those of the Levites and then the Nethanim. Is this representation showing us the symbols of those that would give a message from God that would then call out others that will join them is this showing us symbolically the priests and the levites that we've addressed in the past if you add the um 22, 000, yes sir to the 300 yes if you add the 22,000 to the 300 Ignoring the uh, 9,700, you have that connection then numerically to the number in um, is it Numbers 
chapter three or four, around there, you have 22,300 Levites being mentioned, or if you add them up, uh, there's, there's like 850, 8,500 and 80, and then there's another number, whatever, and then that comes to 22,300. So you have a numeric connection there with that there in Numbers chapter three, I think, um, with with this here and um, in Gideon. Okay. Is there another connection within the studies that have been going on on the different tribes? Is there another 22,300 that we see in those numbers? That's what I've been looking at here. So um, I'm going to try to get a chart drawn out with the the tribes that are mentioned here and their relation to July 18. Okay. Um, so, so one of the things that we have, um, uh, let me see here. So one is we have differences. Uh, it's it's interesting that you have uh, some symbols of differences between the tribes. Um, so we don't have a 300, but we do have a 3100 symbol. And that number is uh, the result of, here it is, just hang on. I think in Numbers chapter one or two, I think there's one, there's two tribes, and the difference between them is 3,000. Um, a 3,000 difference? I have a 3,100. And that's the difference between... Um, Zebulun and okay, that's just Zebulun's numbers, the two different um, Zebulun's numbers one and two and numbers 26. Um, you're saying there's a 3000 one? I don't have that. Yeah, I think, and uh, just without I've, I have a 30,000 between Judah and Reuben. Judah in Numbers 26 and Reuben in Numbers 1 and 2. Right, okay, so that could be it. Oh, and there is yeah, a th there is a 3,000 between Zebulun and Issachar. Um, so that's Zebulun in, that's Numbers 1 and 2. Yeah, that's the one. There, There is that one. So we got a 3,000 and we have a 30,000 and we have a 3,100. But what I'm trying to do is work out these tribes and how they're all interconnected. Um, and when we look at uh, this story here in Judges uh, chapter 7 and we look at the tribes, uh, we can sort of create a structure. But, but I have to work it out, the details and draw it out. Because... Um, yeah, it's it's a little bit involved. So, but but I think that that's what we can do with this, as far as these tribes being mentioned. Uh, because yeah, you're going to have um, the tribes that are mentioned in Judges. What was it? Uh, it's going to be. Uh, where is it here? Where is, where is, do they mention the tribes? Which verse is it? I just can't see it. The tribes that are going to go with him. Which verse? That. Asher. We got Asher and. And Naphtali. Okay. And which verse is it? I just can't see it for some reason. I'm trying to find it. Just a second. 
back in Judges 6. So hang on. Yeah, I'm looking there. just don't see it. Okay, I thought it was like 30-something. I think it's 35. Okay, there it is. Yeah, right before the sign of the fleece. So right. you got Asher, Asher, Zebulun, and Naphtali. Now, we had already addressed Zebulun in connection with um, – uh, that is connected to July 18th, right, because of the date in uh, May 23rd in 1863. But let's also remember that there is that fourth tribe, Manasseh. Yeah, and there's also Manasseh. Yeah, so we have that as well. We have the three and one combination. Yeah, and then we have the difference between Zebulun uh, is, um, let me see here. So, yeah, so we had Zebulun and Issachar had this difference, but we also had, uh, where is this? Okay. I think it was the 3,100. Um, yeah, because we got um, yeah, Zebulun and Zebulun is thirty one hundred difference. So Zebulun, when it's first counted and next counted, so that would give us a symbol of three and one. In this case, it's thirty thousand or three thousand and one hundred instead of three hundred and one. All right. And then um, if we look at the differences then of that number, that period of time is eight years. And uh, let me see here. I'm going to do this. So eight years and 178 days. So 178 is also another symbol connected to July 18th. Right. Isn't it kind of amazing as to how these symbols keep popping up in these different chapters that we've been looking at? Mm-hmm. What are the chances of that, of this kind of symbolism occurring in this way? Well, it's kind of hard to, you know, figure out what the chances are per se, but. Um, Could we say that it is not according to the design of man? Mm -hmm. That this must be in accordance with what God would have us to see. Mm -hmm. So here in 723, and the men of Israel gathered themselves together out of Naphtali and out of Asher and out of Manasseh and pursued after the Midianites. Naphtali, Asher, Manasseh. What's the what's the tribe that's missing in this list? Oh, well, we said Ephraim. No. Oh, 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 this. Um, oh, Zebulun. Right. Okay. Now, the next verse. And Gideon sent messengers throughout all Mount Ephraim, saying, "Come down against the Midianites." And take before them the waters unto Beth Bara and Jordan. Then all the men of Ephraim gathered themselves together and took the waters unto Beth Bara and Jordan. And they, the Ephraimites, took two princes of the Midianites, Horeb and Zeb. 
and they slew Oreb upon the rock Oreb, and Zeb they slew at the winepress of Zeb, and pursued Midian, and brought the heads of Oreb and Zeb to Gideon on the other side of the Jordan. To the Ephraimites were committed Oreb and Zeb. Oreb is slain at the rock Oreb and Zeb at the winepress of Zeb. Zeb is, is slain at the production of the doctrines of Zeb. Why is it important that Oreb is slain at the rock Oreb? What symbol are we being shown here? And what symbol do the Ephraimites present in this portion of the study? What does Oreb mean? I mean, all I'm all I'm given right now out of this with E sword is that this Oreb is the name of a Midianite and of a cliff near the Jordan. Zeb is that of a Midianitish prince. But what can we see here by the definition of their names? Is there any other resource that would give us what the names mean? Oreb means a raven. Okay. And Zeb Zeb means yeah, wolf. Yeah. So Zeb means loaf, L O A F wolf. 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 Like the animal. Okay. I'm uh, sorry. Refer referring to its yellow color. So it's obviously not North American wolves. Yeah, you don't you don't normally find a yellow wolf here. Yeah, well, you, you can get coyotes that are yellow, and they're technically wolves. But uh... so Gideon sent messengers throughout all of Mount Ephraim come down against the Midianites and take before them the waters unto Beth Bara or the house of the ford. What is a ford? Where it, where it pertains to water. Isn't that an easy way to cross a river? So wouldn't this be the house of the river crossing? I guess the point that I'm looking at is these, this, this battle is going on on the west side of the Jordan. The Ephraimites have to be able to ford the river, to cross the river, to continue to pursue the Midianites. So they take the waters unto Beth Bara and the Jordan. And they took the two princes of the Midianites, the raven and the wolf. 
and they slew the raven upon the rock raven and the wolf they slew at the winepress of the wolf. We have made comments in the past of wolves in sheep's clothing. Here is Zeb, the wolf. He is being slain at the wine press of the wolf. He is being slain by the doctrine of the wolf. Is this a doctrine of God? What would you say? What are your thoughts? Is my comment completely off? Not at all. When we started this, you were talking about people that were downgrading what the spirit of prophecy is. I've heard it too. I was taught that in some of the churches that I attended, and I didn't agree with it then, and I don't agree with it now. I put Ellen White on a par with, with the Bible. The more I read of the spirit of prophecy, the more I find that Mrs. White, not only right, but she is definitely inspired of God. I have yet to find passages in the spirit of prophecy that disagree with the Bible. In fact, they support the Bible and they help me to understand more clearly many of the admonitions that are given within the scripture. I have observed too often the net effect of those that choose to set aside the spirit of prophecy and to make the words of the spirit of prophecy appear to be less than that in the Bible. I have observed those that set aside the health message because they read something in the spirit of prophecy that does not agree with their own private interpretation how many times have we seen others that have been within this movement voices that have been amazing in their clarity then choose to leave the movement and leave everything that has anything to do with the Adventist church. How many times have we seen others that have chosen to set aside the movement and return to a corporate church that prefers for others to study as they instruct to keep people asleep? Can this also not be symbolizing the situation of the raven and the wolf? Because is not 
the wilderness of Zeb, the wilderness of the wolf, very much like that of those that choose not to study in the manner that Father Miller has provided, that choose not to compare line upon line within scripture as well as within the spirit of prophecy. Brothers and sisters, we are given a choice. This example with Gideon for me is clarifying the choices that we each need to make in our lives at this time. What else can we see here? in our closing moments today. Okay, so so if we're looking at this story that, that what you've presented, you can see that the enemy is this Midianite enemy, right? Right. And it's these two princes, Oreb and Zeb, that become symbols. Right. Um, so, so we have a raven and a wolf. Now, what would be the characteristics in the scripture? I mean, we know about the wolf as far as it, you know, being in sheep's clothing. But what about the raven? And, and how would this represent the two different ways in which the message has been attacked by the Midianites? Would it be Zeb as the wolf in sheep's clothing that stays in the movement? And Oreb is the mockers? Could be. I mean, because, what, because how, a raven does mock. <laughs> how how do we see a raven? What do you mean? How do you see it? Like, what kind of a bird is a raven? Uh, well, I can't remember the name. Uh, is it like a vulture? Mm. Yes, it's like a very loud crow, a very large and lo loud crow. I mean, I kind of like hearing them, but I know they eat, you know, dead things just like a wolf will, but a wolf will kill. I'm not, I don't know of a raven killing, although they could slowly by gouging out your eyes, for instance. <laughs> okay. Um, Seriously. Yeah, so so they're, scaven they're scavengers, I would think, is what you're trying to say. That's what I'm trying to get at, yes. That's exactly the word I was looking for. So if the raven is a scavenger, does that also make it a mocker or is that someone that picks apart portions of the message picks it apart to their own benefit well that that could be as well but this definitely would represent the way the message has been attacked but i've experienced per uh, personally i've experienced the raven and the wolf oh they're Ravens that pick apart people too, and their wolves that gnash on them. We've got some in the local church here. In Revelation, they call it, he calls them um, hate, um, unclean and hateful birds. Okay. Any other thoughts at this time? Because as we come to the close so, of our, our, go ahead. Yeah, I was just thinking ACR 300 representing the 144,000. 
right? I would agree with and, you. Um, so just uh, numerically, 300 divides into 144,480 uh, times. And uh, in scripture, we have a 480 year period leading up to the building of the Temple of Solomon. Excellent. Which then begins a seven year period of building that temple. And then we have a hundred, sorry, 480 years of the age of Noah, when he then begins to build the ark. Right. And that, so you got 120 year period thereafter. And um, see, um, yeah, so that, that was, uh, you can maybe tie in, tie in them parallels with this story in some way. All right, let's consider this then for our time for tomorrow. Let's take a look at some of this before we go further in this in the study of judges and see what other applications can be made. Are there any other thoughts or comments at this time? Shall we pray? Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for the method in which you are teaching us. We thank you for the way that you are showing us by examples, by symbols, in types and figures, that which would be occurring in our time today. I thank you, Father, for each one that has been in this meeting today, for all of the comments, all of the questions, all of the observations that have been presented. Be with us now, direct us, so that that which we do may be according to your will. For this we thank you, for this we praise you. In the name of Jesus, amen.